Hi there. Thanks so much, Justin. My name is Betty Kaharchuk, and I'm a parent on the focus committee. I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us this evening. We're excited to bring you a speaker tonight on healthy technology use for children. Real quick, just uh, a bit about focus, though. We are a committee in the Unionville Chads Ford School District. We're organized by parents, and we collaborate with the district administration. We provide information and education to parents and the community through seminars, workshops, webinars, and electronic resources. And our mission is to promote well being for families and healthy choices for youth in our community. We couldn't do the good work we do without the tireless support of our district leadership. In particular, this evening came together with the strong support of Chris DeFazio, Director of Communications, and Justin Webb, our technology director, who is running this show behind the scenes. We also want to thank our focus committee administrative representative, John Sandville, superintendent of Unionville Chad's Ford School District. So Justin, if you could advance to the next slide, we'll just uh, take care of a few quick logistics. So um, you may have noticed on your way in, the, this Zoom webinar is being recorded so that it can be viewed after tonight uh, for folks participating and also anybody who couldn't be here. We'll make that recording available on the focus website within a week or two after the event. Um, also tonight, after the presentation portion of the evening, we will conduct a moderated question and answer period. So you can submit your questions at any point using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom webinar. Uh, all questions will be moderated and asked by our focus team at the end of the presentations. And um, if you have confidential questions, though, about your child that are not appropriate to ask out loud at the, for this evening, obviously, please reach out to your school counselor. And if you have any questions at all throughout the evening, you may email us at focus at ucfsd.net or you may chat with us right at the bottom of your screen, of course. So all that said, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Milovidov. Elizabeth came to us as a recommendation from the Great Valley School District after a presentation she gave in the fall of last year. Um, Dr. Milovidov is a lawyer from California, a law professor in Paris, France, and a former digital safety consultant in Europe. Uh, using her European and American focus on the internet technology and social media issues, she researches solutions to empower parents to guide their children in the digital aid. Nope, digital age. She is the founder of Digital M, formerly digitalparentingcoach.com, a website and community with resources and strategies for parents. She's consulted for the Council of Europe through their children's rights and education departments, uh, for Microsoft on digital safety, for Instagram on their parents' guide, for the Family Online Safety Institute on the Digital Parenting Project. And she's an international speaker on digital parenting, safety, and well being. Her work has been featured in OZY, The Wall Street Journal, BBC, France 24, Internet Matters, and other media outlets and organizations focused on child online safety. And somehow, even with all of that, she made time to speak with us. So that said, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth and thank you so much for your time tonight. Oh, thank you, what a really sweet introduction. And um, I always make time for the parents uh, and for the families because I just think this is um, such an exciting time with technology, uh, there's so many opportunities, but um, parents are really um, right in the thick of it. So uh, hopefully tonight I will um, you know, help share a few strategies and tips to guide uh, parents and families and some of those young people, I would say, um, in some healthy technology uh, use. So let me share my screen. This is always the fun part. Is it going to work? And I will just ask for a We see up. your screen. Well, there we go. Perfect. Look at this reverse professional after two years of Zooming, <laughs> we, we've got it all down. So again, I'll be talking about um, healthy technology use. And um, you already had a great introduction um, about who I am and what I've been doing. But I think I, I would just really like to emphasize that um, Digital parenting has been something that I've been focusing on the past 10 years um, because I, as a lawyer, former lawyer, 
a former general counsel, then a law professor. Um, I was doing a lot of consulting on children's rights and technology. Um, and I would notice that in the room, uh, whether it was the conference, an event, that parents weren't always represented. And, you know, sometimes we would have conferences and there would be uh, kids up on the stage, you know, talking about children's rights, but really we weren't hearing a lot about parents. Um, and so I kind of took it upon myself to, to be the one to get in there and to take um, the law, some of these complex um, um, legislations and ideas and just simplify it. Not that I'm saying that parents, you know, need simple parent friendly language, but that it's just nice if somebody just tells it to you like it is. So that is what I have been doing uh, with creating strategies and finding things. So looking at really the best practices around the world, whether we're talking about what's happening in Australia with the e-safety commissioner or what's happening in the United States with FOSI and, and Connect Safely. Um, and FOSI is the Family Online Safety Institute or he, even here in Europe um, with all the different organizations. So I'm really trying to bring you the, the best of the best. And I will also say that that means that if we have questions that if you ask me something that I don't know, and I hope so, because that would be such a challenge, um, I will be able to find that out for you because really the, the child online protection space um, is very small. We are a close knit bunch. And so there you go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the mental health landscape, because really in order to talk about healthy technology use, I'd like to talk about a little bit where we are right now. So um, for sure, and, I'm, and I know that you've heard you know, lots of these things, especially this month being Mental uh, Health Awareness Month, um, but we're really seeing that the, the mental health landscape has changed um, because of the pandemic, uh, because of social media, because of a lot of things um, that we haven't yet find, found the exact causal relationships be, between this and that, but there's a lot of research going on. So what caused this research? Well, in 2020, um, we were seeing that there is, this is in the United States, obviously, uh, an increase of mental health uh, emergency room visits, and you know it's increased by 31% from the previous year. Then um, there were even more in 2021, and because of this, there was a declaration of uh, national emergency in children's mental health. The U.S. Surgeon General um, then did an advisory. I put this on the the slide so you can take a peek at it because it really does talk about um, you know where we are with young people with. Uh, children, and it also provides some tips and strategies uh, as well. But they they only they do speak a little bit to social media and technology, but it, it's an overall um, holistic viewpoint. I've also included some of the resources there for you, so you don't have to dig around. So now that we know that things are, um, I'll say, not so great. Um, you know, let's look at some of the factors that can shape the mental health of young people. And you can see for yourself um, here, this is again a chart, this is from the, um, the same report. You can see that we're looking at social environment, community, family, individual. And even, I'm not going to read every single point, so don't worry, but even as you can see these different points, what you can also realize is how technology interweaves through all of them, right? We can, we can use technology in each one of these types of uh, spaces and relationships, so that adds another layer uh, into you know, these factors that can, shelp, um, that can shape mental health of young people. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to get into rather quickly, because I didn't want to to dwell on on uh, the negative uh, issues and, and some of the fear based problems that are happening, because I think we're all pretty uh, aware um, myself. I am the mother of a 12 year old and a 15 year old. Um, so I, for those of you who are saying, oh, my gosh, yes, she gets it. Um, I really do. I know exactly what it's like, what you're dealing with. Um, but I am still very, very optimistic uh, about the future. And so how do I stay optimistic? Well, I, I share basically healthy tech guidelines uh, with my family. And this is just, you know, a few of the, the top best ones that I was thinking of, um, you know, obviously the first and foremost is to be attentive, right, um, to the use of social media games and technology. And when I'm saying being being attentive, it's, you know, are, are you um, 
turning on, uh, picking up your phone because you're standing in line uh, at the supermarket and you're bored. And I'm talking about our children too. Um, are they on the bus? You know, are they uh, waiting for a friend to call and they just pick it up because it's it's there and they're bored. Um, same thing with gaming. You know, why are they using it? What what are they using it for? Is it really just to you know take a little break or is it something else? I think that something that is absolutely key in this idea of, of healthy tech guidelines um, and mental health is this idea of recognizing, managing, and learning from difficult emotions. So I'm going to try to uh, open this up a little bit more. When we are online and when our children are online, all sorts of things are happening, right? I just showed you that previous slide that showed it could be within your community, within your family, et cetera. So all these different layers. And we don't know uh, the different types of emotions. You know, are they upset? Are they sad? Are they feeling anxious? Um, you know, are they being, unfortunately, are they being harmed? Are they being cyber bullied? So I think that one of the, the key things that we can do to help um, regulate um, the use of technology in a healthy way is to understand, to, to recognize when something is happening. How, how am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? Um, you know, what can you learn from what situation caused me to learn? So now you're thinking, okay, wait, this sounds really interesting, but how do I actually apply this? So the idea here is, let's say you have a teenager and you notice that they are feeling anxious or um, they're, they're, acting, uh, they're acting up a little bit and after being on their phone, right? So the simple thing is not to ask, you know, what were you looking at? What's going on? But to say, hey, you know, having a conversation, how are you feeling? Um, you know, should you take a little break? Do you think, you know, was it something that you saw, something that you um, read? You know, what are ways that you think uh, can help you to feel better about this situation? So it's, it's all of these types of experiences. And I know parents and caregivers uh, that you are, that you already do this uh, in the real world. So it's sometimes just a matter of taking technology out. Um, actually, I, don't ask me why, but I immediately thought of the, that book um, by Sandra Boyden, um, you know, Why Are You Crying Pookie? I think that's what it is. And so the whole time, the, the rhyme, those of you with younger children will remember, you know, are you, why are you sad, Pookie? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? I mean, that's just in the real world, right? It's not without um, technology. So another point, obviously, is building strong relationships with peers and with trusted adults. We need to keep letting our little people know. And when I say little people, I am meaning all the way up to the young people. They're always going to be our babies. Um, you know, that, that we are there as a trusted adult, that we will be able to listen to them without always taking away the technology. I know that sometimes that's the easiest thing. I'll just take it away. I'll just shut it down. Um, but when you do that, we have to remember that we are sometimes cutting them off from their networking, from their connections, from schoolwork, et cetera. Um, so I think another key point as well is building strong relationships with your peers. Let's face it, sometimes we are not always the trusted source in the room. They are asking their neighbor, their friend, their best buddy, you know, what do you think about this? What do you know about that? If you know the children that your children are hanging around with and there are strong relationships and everybody you know, has their head on straight for the most part, uh, we are allowed to make mistakes. Um, I think that these are also really good signs because you want the, your children to be able to talk to somebody else and say, you know, I'm really not feeling so great today. Did you see that um, Instagram post talking about all of us uh, in college or in high school? And then that trusted peer would say, yeah, I saw that. And I didn't feel so great about, you know, about that either. So it's all of these sorts of things, again, uh, talking a lot about um, emotions. And I think I should probably say I'm not a psychologist, um, but these are all of the, the common sense uh, practices that we're seeing from such trusted resources um, as the London School of Economics, where they do have psychologists, or from a digital wellness lab uh, with Dr. Michael Rich with, in Boston. Um, so, you know, they're, they, I have brought together a lot of the things that they have said. Um, and that I've also shared with some of the digital parents and digital families and have seen in practice. Uh, I also think that opting for healthy balance, I mean, obviously this one's a kind of a no brainer, right? But let me just change it up a bit by telling you, it's not always about screen time because I know a lot of times parents say, oh, you know, screen time, one hour, two hours. It's not always that. It's about looking for that healthy balance, meaning look at the content, look at what the quality of, of the materials they're looking at. For sure, 
uh, two hours of watching Call of Duty, uh, which is an 18 plus shooter game, is not going to be the same as two hours of learning Latin, right? So I think that, you know, you have to look at that healthy balance. And even then, if your child is online, you know, 12 hours a day learning Latin, you're going to say, okay, what's going on here? Let me, let me try to figure this out. Let me opt again for this healthy balance. Um, finding positive role models, of course, and I say this offline and online, because we want uh, your, we want our children to uh, realize that, you know, you can put your phone down and that is how you are modeling uh, healthy, uh, uh, tech use. And then there are also the people that they're following uh, who say, hey, you know, I'm out of the office or I'm not taking any messages right now. These are all things where people say, hmm, they took a break. Maybe I can too. And then lastly, I think something that we can do, and I just as I said that I started squirming, uh, which is something that I always call like a, a healthy tech audit, which means we're thinking about our eyesight. Uh, we're thinking about our back, our neck. I'm sure those of you who are sitting here watching me, if you just start moving around, you're going to say, oh yeah, I'm a little tender. I'm a little sore. Uh, and I think we need to remind um, our young people that if they're feeling anything, physically, if there's a physical manifestation uh, of something, then obviously, you know, they need to shift things up, they need to make a, a change. Um, I think it's also important here uh, to note, I mentioned sedentary because, of course, with, we're all just sitting behind screens. Uh, we need to get up and, and move more. Uh, during the pandemic, I bought a little walking treadmill. I have to admit, I don't do it as much as I, I should because I find that I'm up walking and I need to take notes. And I'm like, I can't walk, take notes and look at the screen at the same time. So I'm going to have to work on that. Um, but the other the, one of the small point, and then I'm going to move on because I'm spending way too much time on this slide because I'm super excited, um, is eyesight. I really want you to remember remember eyesight. And the reason why I say this is because, again, a few years ago, I had attended a conference um, and uh, it was up to, oh, I always say this word crazy, eye doctors. I'm just going to say eye doctors. Um, and they were talking about the increasing um, um, cases of myopia, nearsightedness that they're seeing in children. And they were linking this to screen use. So it's not something that's just, you know, making it up. It's something that's, that's real. Ask your children if they have headaches, um, ask them if their vision is blurry. These are all, like I said, signs that they need to step, up, step back and, and take a break. Okay, I'm going to move a little bit faster, I promise. I'm just checking my time too. I want to make sure I leave you time for questions. So, um, so because we're going into the summer, right? I know, I can't believe it's already around the corner here. We're mid-May. Um, is that I really also wanted to say, in addition to the, the, the tips that I just shared, but remember, you know, with summer, and here I show the empty classroom, so I'm thinking, you know, that summer slide, right? Um, but I think that as much as we want uh, our children to still be doing things, opt for as much of those offline activities as possible. And, um, you know, we're, we're, when it can be educational or continuing um, just their, their growth and maturity, then opt for those as well. It's not just sitting there in front of a screen uh, bored uh, and watching things. And I do have to say boredom can be good because that's when we children are creative, when they start figuring out different things to do. Think about your own childhood um, when you were bored uh, and you would kick a can, or I know for myself going, I just, so crazy. I can't even believe I'm saying this and it's going to be recorded, but whatever, going out into the street and, you know, playing in like mud, right? You know, you, there was like dirt and you could like build things and, and you could, you know, put a little boat in the little alley and the alley in the side of the curb and watch it float away. I mean, these were things that we would do when we were bored and yet it's still creative. It's still being outside. Um, I also think that you need to set non-tech times, especially for the summer. We have to be really, um, you know, clear on that because some of you, like myself, may be working over the summer, and so our children, they're not in summer camps. If they're not doing scheduled activities, we, we don't really necessarily know what they're doing. So it's kind of cool. And for the older kids, I know you're thinking, how am I going to, you know, have them uh, be in control of these situations? And the answer is very clear: be creative, speak with them. You know, what's our summer plan going to be? You decide. You decide. Uh, design it to create something. Um, two other things that are just um, some additions for summer is just to always, and this is really my digital safety hat on, but turning off your geolocalization, there's no reason to tell uh, all the robbers in your neighborhood that you are going to the beach uh, for the day or that you are, um, you know, I don't know, going on vacation for a week or two. And also consider turning off those notifications. And you should be doing that anyway, um, because notifications are one way, I'll mention this a little bit later, notifications are one way that it's just keeping you into your phone. We all know, you hear that bing, 
and you're like, oh, oh, was that a message? Um, you can live without that. You can also, no tech tip, you can also change your colors, uh, the notifications on your screens, change it to black and white, put it in grayscale. Um, if you don't know how to do that, just go onto Google or any other search engine and put how to put my phone in grayscale. It works for all phones. Um, and I can promise you, it's pretty boring when it's just gray and you see all the little icons and it's not that exciting. Uh, lastly, is being mindful about when posting images. And this is because we're in the summer. And here again, I'm talking with uh, my safety hat on because let's face it, summer, we have a tendency to wear less clothing, um, to wear uh, t-shirts and tank tops and tube tops and short shorts and bathing suits and all of these things. And really we should just need to be mindful uh, and teach our children to be mindful about what they're posting and how images can stay forever. And that even if it's up for just a second, someone can screenshot shot it, etc. I know that you've already had internet safety uh, talks, so I'm not going to go much further there. So let's talk about, um, I'm just wondering, I hope Betty that there's like questions coming in and, and things happening. So I realize I'm just talking, I'm having a great time by myself, um, but I'm going to keep going until somebody tells me to stop. So uh, I also want to share, and maybe I'll put it in the chat later, but you can see the exact uh, uh, title of this article. Um, and this is Families and Screen Time. And this was a project that uh, I also uh, contributed to for the London School of Economics. And they were really looking at um, how can we help families um, identify you know, when it's too much. And I put um, addiction in quotation marks because Addiction is a hard word to use. And until they come up with uh, a real medical case of internet addiction, um, it, the child online protection experts, we are cautious about using this. We do talk about internet gaming disorder, which is an addiction, which is by the World Health Organization, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so what the, the bottom line here is that in this policy brief, which was super interesting, probably more so for me than for you, but at any rate, Five questions. How can you know uh, if you're having an issue with technology, if it's problematic use, addiction? So five questions you ask yourself. Is my child sleeping well? Is my child eating well? Is my child doing well in school? Is my child, or does my child maintain good relationships with me, with family members, friends? You know, are they being respectful? And does my child have a decent relationship, a good relationship with their devices, technology, etc.? If the answer to these questions are mostly yes, then you're really okay. Um, just because your child does not come when you call them to dinner does not mean they are addicted. I know I say this sometimes myself. Uh, we shouldn't always say that, but it just means that they are engrossed in it. And why are they so engrossed in it? It's because the companies design it this way to make it super exciting. So that way they, they stay with it. They want to know. Um, if you also want to just liken it when your child is, I don't know, playing Minecraft Fortnite or looking, scrolling through social media and you just can't tear their attention in a way, think about you when you're watching your favorite Netflix series or when you're watching the news and they're just getting ready to say something crucial about some topical issue and you're, and then somebody comes in and asks you a question. You're like, wait, 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 wait. It's that same sort of attraction um, that they have too for things that are you know, that we don't think are as interesting, but for them, they really are. So just to give you a definition on addiction, I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, this is from the World Health uh, uh, Organization. This just came out, I believe, uh, I want to say two years ago, but maybe it's a little bit uh, uh, longer, but um, 2020, there we go, talking about addictive behaviors. So I think what's really important for you to notice, and I highlighted it in red, right, is that for gaming disorder, for this internet addiction to be di diagnosed, we are talking about um, sufficient severity, uh, a change in the behavior patterns, um, significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational, and other areas of functioning. And wait for it, it's not just for one week, one month. We're talking, it has been evident for at least 12 months. That's a year, people. This is when we're talking about internet addiction, uh, gaming addiction. So keep that in the back of your mind um, that it's not as simple as we think. Okay. So then how do we recognize some of these things, right? Um, we, we're talking about problematic use. I'm sure that you all have your own examples of different things that have happened in your, in your families. I would love it if you, if you um, throw them in the chat so that way you can share with other people. If it's not too personal, because we always want to respect your privacy. Um, it, but just, you know, looking at some of these signs and symptoms, um, you know, just being tired. Um, and the opposite of that, of too, is, you know, that they have insomnia, so they're awake. Um, these are all 
uh, little signals to you that something isn't quite right. Aches and pains, obviously that's because of that lack of movement. If you're sitting there at your computer all day, or if you're hunched over uh, scrolling on a uh, tablet or an, um, a smartphone, you know exactly what I'm gonna say. How do you feel? How does your neck feel? Um, there are also things that you probably weren't considering, but like some of these compulsive uses um, where we know that, um, you know, I, for lack of a better word, I don't know who's sitting in your house and listening. So I'm going to just say adult websites and you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, if they're looking at things like this or, you know, gambling, gambling is huge, uh, causing online issues. Information searching, I know that you probably didn't even think about this. Um, and another one that, that has come up since the pandemic is doom scrolling, right? So doom scrolling is obviously what it sounds like. You're on your phone and you're scrolling, 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 and you're looking at all the doom and gloom that's online and you just keep going. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that happened. So, you know, th this is some pretty unhealthy use of your, your technology. Uh, what else can you use as a, as a symptom um, when your child loses track uh, of time, they just picked up their phone that, or you yourself just picked up your phone. You said, we're going to check one message or send one email and blink of an eye. And it's two hours later. Um, you haven't gotten dinner started, but you do have a great Pinterest collection or you've answered some emails uh, to, for Instagram chatting, et cetera. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, or again, this is something that you might see with younger children too, is that they're dreaming about going online. Um, you know, you, they're talking about playing Minecraft and the next thing that they're gonna do as soon as they can get back online. A little bit obviously is them just be, being creative, but you can see when it starts to become too much. So again, parents, this is for you um, to really be observing and um, to not just scoff and say, oh, you know, they're, they're teenagers or their tweens, or this is just normal angst, um, but to, to sit there and think maybe there's something going on here. Um, and again, I think that the, I, I think it's really important to mention that some of these are, you know, just symptoms. They could be symptoms of other things. I know, for example, one of the uh, one of the um, examples that I use is, you know, a child closing their their computer uh, quickly when you walk into the room, and so parents are always like, "Oh yes, I wonder what they're doing." I'm sure they're looking at adult websites or other things. Again, maybe they're planning a birthday party for you, right? So it's just we 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 don't always know. So just take this as a, a as a list, something to keep in the back of your mind, and you, you know, keep your finger on the pulse in your own family. So let's get to some of the, the really interesting things. Let's talk about um, persuasive design. So persuasive design. Um, this is the, the the how they have created technology where they are really going in. The, the developers are are tweaking their design, and they're doing this so they can specifically change a u user's opinion, attitude, behavior. Why? To meet their goals. What can their goals be? Their goals can be something positive or something negative. Uh, their goals can be purely commercial. Um, I have put on the, the, the slide um, one of the best um, reports that I've seen recently on persuasive technology, and it's from Humane Tech, um, the Center for Humane Technology. And uh, they are the same people who did the movie, The, um, the Social Dilemma, which I also think that uh, all families should watch. Um, so that way they have an idea of exactly this about persuasive design, um, algorithms, how things are designed to keep your attention. I think that when you're able to show this, and especially in this sort of storytelling, entertaining mode, that is how you can get young people uh, and children to say, ah, wow, this is happening to me. So just really quickly, just to mention some uh, design factors. So motivation, right? Um, you know, the psychologists, the people who ha are creating these, these things, and this is not any sort of uh, uh, slam against psychologists, it's because they were paid to, do a, to consult about how the, the human brain works for certain things. And, you know, we can sit here and, uh, you know, even water, if you want to take it that far, even water can be dangerous if you, you know, drink a bazillion gallons, right? So I'd, I'd want to take the onus off of psychologists for having go gone in and done some of this work. Um, but they did find these connections and they were able to say, 
you can do X with technology plus Y um, with technology to get Z this result in human brains and behavior. So some of these things we're thinking about, again, motivation, a desire for a social connection. People want to connect. That's why they have the like buttons or the thumbs up, et cetera. Um, um, the user must have the ability to easily do what the app wants you to do, right? Let's face it. If it's something that is complicated to do, you're not going to be persuaded to stay on your device. So a perfect example of this is parental controls. How many of you have tried to put parental controls up, right? And it's just like you were like, oh my gosh, forget it. It's okay. I'll deal with it. Um, it's things like this. If they really wanted this to have parental controls, it would be click, they're on. Um, triggers um, are things that are, you know, prompting features. Again, I mentioned those notifications. And there's an example of a really beautiful colored screen iPhone, um, uh, you know, with all the little icons sitting there. And these things, I mean, they keep you back. I don't know about you, but if you look at the on that screen and you see, for me, those 67 um, unread chat messages, I just, I just I'm just like, whoa, that's a lot. I'm wondering if it's something important. Is it the kid's school? Is it this? Is it that? So you're not alone, but just to realize, you know, what is behind some of this. Um, I also think it's important to, to mention in the same space, um, AI, artificial intelligence and algorithms, because we are seeing more and more uh, use of not just um, human design, but technology for technology's sake and, and how this is also influencing human behavior. So things like, um, you know, where social media companies can monitor your likes, um, they can make sure that you stay in the system with endless scrolling because they keep showing you the most most fabulous, interesting things that you've ever seen. Uh, because let's face it, they either um, looking at your data, they know that you saw that one cat video and that you thought, thought it was so funny that you went back and watched it three times and perhaps you even shared it. And so what are they going to do? The algorithm is going to start sending you more cat videos, right? So cat videos are one thing, but when we're talking about teenagers um, looking at a diet, for example, and trying to find out, I don't know, what the difference between Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig. Um, and then all of a sudden they go into a spiral of the algorithms of uh, dieting techniques, what's the fastest way to lose weight. Uh, and the next thing you know, they're on pro-ana websites. Pro-ana is pro-anorexia. Um, so, I mean, it's things like this that can take you uh, down the rabbit hole. Um, checking notifications, as I um, just mentioned, um, and then they incentivize you to, to keep coming back. Um, that is really the, the beauty of a lot of this technology is that they have worked it out so well to make you want to get back in there. And this is when I want to say it's kind of difficult to fight human nature in this respect, but we're going to have to learn to do a better job in order to maintain, maintain that healthy technology, uh, technological balance. Um, because let's face it, and you know, a lot of things that are great for you and that feel great at the time, if we use them in overabundance, it can be uh, not so good. And yes, I'm thinking of chocolate. Um, okay, so giving children your, your tech for the first time, this was just a question um, that uh, I've, I've received it before in the past, and, and um, the organizers also asked me to mention this. Um, and I think that this is, again, we're talking about younger children. And the key words here I have for you are begin as you mean to go on. And that means have health, you know, front of mind, just as with your children, you're sitting there already, you know, that when they start eating uh, solid foods, you're not just saying, yeah, bring on the, the, the chocolate, again, the chocolate, <laughs> bring on the chocolate and fast food. Of course not, right? You're trying to uh, introduce them to healthy choices. So that way in the future, when they become young adults, they will know that they can eat, um, you know, a portion of proteins, vegetables, et cetera. So this same sort of healthy use, we have to do this with technology. Um, and one of the ways that you can also do this is by reading the terms of use um, on whatever it is, a platform, a gaming site, look at it together, um, of course, with a child, a teenager, somebody that's old enough to talk about, hey, are you okay with them having your data, uh, with them with them uh, owning your photos? And I shouldn't say own, because you are the owner of your photos and images and videos, but you've given them a license to use them. And so I think that if a lot of people knew that, they probably would not um, upload as many photos and images. And before you say it, Elizabeth, I have it in private mode, et cetera. 
there's no such thing as private on online. So let's just forget that right there. Um, I also think that when you're just going back to children, young children, you're giving them tech, you know, understand what the safety centers are. Almost every single gaming platform, uh, social media platform, they have safety centers. Get in there and read the parents' guides. I know it's a little extra, but really you're giving this stuff to your children and we cannot continue with this social experiment of let's just, you know, throw the spaghetti against the wall and see where it sticks. We can't, we have to do um, a little bit more here. And, and again, this digital, this idea of digital well-being is, is the way that we can achieve this. Create a family media agreement together. I know together, that means you're gonna ask them their opinion. And really, again, this is for the, the kids that are speaking and can tell you, um, you know, how much is too much? You know, they have an idea. Uh, I sometimes I've given talks with uh, students and I've, I've done surveys where I've asked the, the kids, how much is too much? And, you know, is it one hour a day, two hours a day, five hours a day? And then I ask the same questions to the parents and I match them up. And believe it or not, the kids always choose less amounts of time than the parents. And it's really interesting uh, when you think of that because you think that you know kids just wanna be online all the time and they really don't. So also for this family media agreement and for everything that you're deciding together, decide those consequences for non-respect of your rules, guidelines, uh, policies, the things that you have pulled together, um, because you can't just say, oh, well, they, they, they didn't follow my rules. Okay, I'll, I'll give it back to them, no big deal. There needs to be some sort of consequence for it. Okay, Whew, moving right along. Um, so unhealthy tech cycles. I wanted to mention this because um, I think it's important that we uh, look at um, time, content and impact right and again um, this is where we're just looking at our unhealthy use and saying how much time uh, am i spending on these devices how much time is my child spending this is how you're able to see that they're in an unhealthy cycle and then you can find ways to get out so i think time is one way um, uh, it is this uh, technological use is it taking away from healthy offline activities the answer is yes. Well, you need to shuffle things up again. You can also look at content, right? What what devices are they using? What um, content are they looking at? If it's meaningful, you already know that I'm a big fan of meaningful and healthy choices and being online for educational entertainment. Of course, you can watch the, the silly cat videos for a little while, but not hours and hours, right? So then again, the flip side of that is what are some of the healthier choices that you can be making? Um, impact is quite frankly, again, going back to this sort of um, this emotional well-being of your children, how do they feel? Um, uh, no matter what the circumstance, what are they playing? What are they looking at? Uh, what are they doing online? What are they watching streaming? You know, how do they feel um, afterwards? And are there possible healthier uses for that device, um, uh, for that website, et cetera, to help them feel better? So, and I'm still just moving right along. And um, I wanted to put this slide up because as I'm kind of, you know, bringing you on this journey about healthy tech use, I wanted to um, mention that just because it's easy and just because it's convenient, uh, and I'm putting myself in this basket too, um, the times when we let our children, you know, um, stay too long on an iPad or a gaming console, or when we're in a restaurant and we've given them an iPad to keep them busy for a second. No parent shaming. I'm just calling it out, right? Just because it's easy and convenient uh, doesn't mean that we always have an excuse to continue. And the reason why is because I think um, it's really important that you remember that we're talking about your, your child's development here and child development and technology. I'm not going to say they're two words that don't go together because that's definitely not true, but they are two words that you really have to be very uh, cautious with. And so I put a couple examples uh, on the slide. So, for example, have you ever tied your child's shoes when they refuse to put down a tablet? Um, you know what I'm going to say. If the answer is yes, I think you're going to need to rethink that, right? Because what 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 is our purpose as as a parent as a caregiver? We're trying to raise healthy, autonomous, uh, independent people. Um, and if we are making some of these decisions for them or preventing them from understanding the rules and consequences, well, we're not really doing them a, a service. Um, have you done your teens' chores when they refuse to get off the com computer? And I'm gonna put up a kind of guilty hand on this one. And it's not that I've done chores, but like I took out the dogs because it was just easier for me to do it convenience than to sit there and keep, you know, saying, get off, get off, right? 
it does happen. It happens to all of us. You know, you can't, there is no such thing as a perfect uh, tech balanced house. So please don't think that. And um, so with all of that in mind, I wanted to, again, uh, give you some strategies for, for mindful engagement, because again, we're talking about all of this mental health and using technology in mindful ways. And um, I also wanted to put up, that's a screenshot from uh, the Digital Wellness Lab that I mentioned uh, earlier. And I, I do like their definition, how uh, digital wellness is an intentional state of physical, mental, and social health, right? That occurs with mindful engagement with the digital and natural environment. So this is really, it's not just all digital. Um, it's about getting off the, the technology, going outside, doing other things. It's being intentional uh, about your use of social media, your use of video games, other technologies. And, you know, I didn't even mention um, um, smart assistance and a lot of the technology we have in our homes. Again, convenience, it's great, but just to be mindful of, you know, the examples that you set when you're saying, hey, Alexa, hey, Google, do this, do that, right? Um, just to think about that, how do you want your children to emulate you? Um, being being aware of the time that you spent online um again this is that idea of quality time and so i use the uh, center for humane technology um uh, i think i think they were the ones who said time well spent um and i really like this idea of time well spent out online because that just shows that you can do positive things and again lastly i think finding that content that makes you feel good um you know it's the same thing with any sort of mindful engagement in the real world why do so many people like yoga and meditation and things that are bring, bring to mind mindfulness and, and even just breathing exercises, right? It's because afterwards they feel better, they feel good. And I think that's something that we have to remember with technology. Um, and for that, of course, there are all sorts of um, wonderful apps too, if you need a little help. Uh, with things like, um, um, oh, I can just think of it, Headspace, for example, is one um, where it can just guide you into some uh, mindful engagement that then you would turn off your technology to continue on your own. Okay, so I think that, uh, again, we're, we're seeing this sort of pattern here where I'm really trying to get you to prioritize mental health uh, over tech use. Um, again, even though I love technology and social media and online video games, I think all that stuff is really cool um, that I think we all know mental health is, is number one, right? So I think that what we need to do uh, with our young people is to help them prioritize mental health over their tech use. So, um, so four quick things uh, to, to get, you, get a conversation started, because again, that is something that is so important for you to do is to have these conversations with uh, your young people, with your teens, you know, wh what does this mean? What does mental health mean for you? How are you feeling online, right? Um, when I do, again, uh, safety talks um, and trying to get parents engaged with the conversation starters, it's always uh, the four W's, you know, who, who are you talking to online? What are you doing online? Where are you going online? When are you going online, um, et cetera. So prioritizing that sort of mental health uh, is what we want your children to be able to do on their own. And one of the very first things that you can do to empower them is to make sure that they can ask for help, right? Um, ask that they can ask you for help. If they think they have an online issue, they can ask a trusted adult that you've identified um, because the last thing you want is for them, you know, Googling answers to some answers uh, to some problems that they may be having. Um, you want to be their, their line of, uh, of, uh, first resort. Um, investing in healthy online social connections, right? So again, we want uh, our young people when they are online to uh, be with peers or, and to watch content that is positive. Having healthy connections is another way to continue to have healthy mental health, obviously healthy mental health, you know what I mean. Um, and then the third thing is spending time with others in real life. Yes, that's so important as well as online. Being online is super cool, but being offline and you know having that face-to-face -face interaction now that we can again, um, I mean, this is just fundamental. And I think that um, we have to push our children and young people to do this more because they've had a lot less in the past two years and they have to relearn a lot of these of these skills of just, you know, going to the mall, just going to the movies, going to an ice skating rink, what have you. Um, but, you know, offer some ideas, perhaps, you know, um, make some suggestions with other uh, classmates or family members or community members. 
for, and then the last one, um, and like I said, of course, this is just my, my top four, volunteering. Um, in order to prioritize mental health, um, you know, having something that is purposeful um, and, and developing your own sense of self-worth, ha helping your child do that is just huge. Um, sometimes, yes, we can cheat and they can do, they can volunteer for online things. Yes, I've seen that. But I mean, really, it's this whole idea that it's offline uh, in real life and it's some sort of volunteer work in that way um, that will also boost their mental health. And again, they won't always be on tech. So I wanted to give you some ideas um, because you have your your these high school uh, high school age kids and also college students and two things that I really wanted to mention when we're talking about again um, using healthy technology use is one have them do a social media cleanse and actually you yourself can do that uh, as well a social media cleanse means you're just going to go in and just as it sounds you're going to clean up all of the stuff that you don't need. And I'm not going to say all of the, the toxic things or the things that make you feel badly, but I am going to say, if you're looking at it and you're like, eh, then go ahead and delete it. You don't need that account. You don't, you don't need it anymore. You don't use it. Um, if there's old images, you know, get rid of them. Um, just go in and, and really try to, I'm not saying make yourself obsolete, but sit there and think, and this is again for the high schoolers and the college students, what would a future recruiter see, a future college recruiter see if they Googled your name uh, on social media? What would a future employer see for the college students who are heading out um, if they Googled your name, right? And it doesn't just stop there. You can also put a Google alert uh, on your names, and this is for the, the kids too. So that way, anytime their name is mentioned or they're tagged, it'll pop up and then they can be proactive Go ask that person to take it down, not untag me, or go and talk to the platform and say, pull it down. So um, a social media cleanse, that should help you feel much better. Uh, usually I recommend that in springtime. Yes, so it's perfect. I recommend it for springtime. Um, and social media for good, my goodness. You know, social media does get a bad rap, uh, but there are ways that we can have these connections. We can do this networking and we can use social media for good example, uh, some of that volunteer work that I was talking about, right? So it's purposeful, they're feeling great, self-worth. Um, so how about posting a few images and posting a, a few posts about that volunteer work? Again, not with showing images of other people or uh, even your, your students, if you don't want to, um, you can do things with hands or, you know, collages. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to, to write a post and share something about something fabulous that your child has done without, you know, having them sit there and smile uh, for the camera. So those were just a couple of ideas. Um, if, you know, I think for college students, they can pretty much uh, go and Google social media for good and find even more examples uh, of things that they can do. For example, starting a, 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 a fundraiser or crowdfunding for a cause that they believe in, et cetera. There's tons of great things out there. Um, Professional support, I'm winding down now. So I've given you a bunch of ideas, um, different strategies, and I really wanted to make sure that I didn't just uh, load you up with a bunch of things and then leave you hanging where you're saying, oh my goodness, this is great, but now how do I maintain? So I wanted to mention, um, again, Digital Wellness Lab, so that way you can actually see um, you know, the logo, what they look like. What I think is really interesting is that um, this is from their newsletter. Uh, so it just came out and helping our children stay mentally well in our increasingly tech centric uh, world. So, I mean, just absolutely perfect um, uh, timing. So um, and I just see if there was a question come up in the chat. Oh, was it me? OK, so that's great. I'm going to keep going. And uh, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat. That would be lovely. Um, another uh, great resource for you is Your Teen Magazine. And I am just limiting this to uh, um, US uh, resources. If you wanted something else, um, please just email me um, and I will be happy to, to share a list of resources um, in Europe or elsewhere that I know of. Um, but um, here for Your Teen Magazine, they do a lot of articles. Uh, I've, I've also um, done work with them and, and um, posts and podcasts and, and things like that. Um, but they are also grappling with these issues. And because they also have a big community, um, they pull those uh, resources and strategies um, for you as well. 
Um, I already mentioned this, but I just want to say it again. It's the social dilemma. I think that this is a wonderful way to uh, get your children to just pause and reflect upon what they're posting. Um, and not only what they're posting, but how, uh, for those of you who've seen the movie, um, uh, the young boy at one point, he's de depicted as a puppet, you know, like um, Pinocchio with the strings and how he's being controlled. And it is very interesting to, to see that. I'm not gonna, no, no spoiler uh, alerts. Um, it's interesting to see that because we have all experienced it. And I think that that is a great teaching moment uh, where you can pause it and you can discuss this with your, your families. And actually you can even go on their website and they have um, speaking guides, uh, discussion guides for you to have conversations with your families in schools, with your communities. So um, they are really trying to do what they can to help us all with uh, some healthy balance. And then of course I have a uh, digital parenting community on Facebook. Um, so you are more than welcome to join. Again, it's on Facebook. So that means that you're gonna be scrolling, uh, but it's really was one of the only ways um, I could get a hold of people. Um, so we have a uh, child psychologist, child online protection experts. Um, I do not have any speech therapists. I would love to get some speech therapists uh, because I think that it's really important to talk about, um, especially especially for the younger children, child development, what's happening if they are not, you know, seeing um, uh, parents speaking, moving their lips in front of them, but they're watching, you know, puppets on a screen, what happens, um, how their speech can be delayed. So uh, anyway, at any rate, there's parents, uh, grandparents, caregivers, all there, and we're all doing the same thing that you are. We are just working on this and looking uh, and trying to make things better. Um, resources for young people. Again, um, I thought this was very interesting uh, and I wanted to make sure I gave it to you in my slide. Um, you can also find uh, um, these resources for this mental health. Um, this is from the um, US Surgeon General's report. And the fact that this is such a huge initiative right now means that it's getting a lot of uh, uh, space and, and, and um, um, air on air time, if you will. And so I think we should need to take advantage of it. And I think that for anyone who's saying, yes, but I don't want to admit right now, really, there, there is no shame in this. There is no stigma. Um, technology is pervasive. It, internet is ubiquitous. We are all, you know, grappling with these issues. So I think that there's no shame in raising your hand and saying, I need a little help. Um, there are also um, resources that relate to uh, online mental health, so mental health and technology, uh, where you can get resources from the Healthy Children, um, Parents Ultimate Guides from Common Sense Media, and I, I always love Common Sense Media because they're talking a lot about, um, you know, the current trends, um, current challenges, whatever is happening, so that way you can get up, you can get in a leg up on that to have those conversations um, with your um, with your people. And I think that is it for me. And look at that. I've got a, just a couple minutes to go. Oh, it's lovely. Um, so if you have any uh, questions, please put them in the chat. I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. I think that it's also um, just really important, again, that I stress how much uh, control you, you do have. I know sometimes you feel powerless, um, but you really can do a lot of these things. And I would also stress that, you know, I'm only with you for an hour, but you know, once I leave, you have a community, you have your own, um, parenting community, you have your school community, speak with other parents, ask them, what do they do? Just as before, when we had our babies and we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the first food going to be, we asked other people, or how do you get your child to sleep? Mine's not sleeping. You asked other people. So, you know, how do you find, you know, technology, tech, oh, I'm having the worst time with that word, probably because it's really late for me now. Um, how can you maintain technology, technological um, um, balance in your families? Ask someone, how do they do it in theirs, right? There, there's no shame. You're just asking. Maybe it will work for you. Maybe it won't. But the idea is uh, that you two are a digital parenting community. Now, I'm going to take a breath and ask Betty if there was anything else that you wanted me to, to cover. Um, and if Thank I missed any so key much. points, oh, not a problem. No, no, this is great. So, um, we do have some questions coming in. So, um, thanks. That's a great presentation. And I think we, um, yep, we've got some good questions to ask you. So, if it's all right, I'll jump right in with the question. Sure. Yep. Okay. 
So the first one we have is um, uh, a parent said, I understand that gaming addiction requires a year for official diagnosis. Uh, but do you have any insights on how you prevent your child from getting to this point, having issues functioning and, um, you know, functioning in family and friend relationships and society in general before you reach that first year? Yeah, I, I love that question because it's true. Um, it, it just means, you know, um, we get it. Yeah, the, the 12 months is one thing, but I'm talking about here and now. And I don't even want to deal with this for one week where they're in front of the screen the entire time. I hear you. Um, and I think that, again, this is where we're talking about that balance, right? Balance and boundaries. And it also depends on the age of the child. And I would really like to stress one thing here, too, is that if your child is vulnerable in any way, um, that you need to keep that in mind because with um, with the online gaming uh, communities, whether it's vulnerable because they are um, different, um, they are going to be faced with different um, challenges in those in those online worlds because the space is not always a great space um, where the the chat and the sort of toxic behavior that is happening there, and also. Um, if they have any sort of uh, uh, challenges where they're vulnerable and they just, they need to be online, um, they need to be playing, um, this is how they, you know, fix things in their, in their, in their minds. Those are also, um, it's an extra challenge for you. Um, I know that there have been fantastic things done um, with Minecraft and autism, for example. Um, and I think that, that, you know, there are great techniques and there are wonderful ways to help children who are uh, neurodiverse. But I also think we have to be careful uh, about, um, you know, saying this is great for this child and it's great for all neurodiverse children um, because it's not. And, and we see, unfortunately, that a lot of the, the um, addictions are in vulnerable children. Um, and wait for it because I am the mother of two boys we see the, those problems and those issues more with boys than we do with girls, which is also very interesting. Um, but going back to your question uh, uh, again, is, you know, so what can you concretely do? Again, understanding who your child is, making sure that your child understands uh, your um, limits, you know, sitting down with them and discussing this, but also, you know, get into that with them, play the game. Uh, you know, I know, I know, bear with me, but play the game, you know, 20 minutes worth and just say, you know, why, is, why do you like this so much? What's so cool about it? Okay, I get it. I respect it that you love this, but we're going to have to find a way for you to balance this with your piano, soccer, ballet, what have you, and, and have them create their schedule, have them create the agreement of the do's and the don'ts and the consequences. And do not be in any way surprised if it falls off track within a week or two, you have to keep at it. These, this is one of those things where until it is an ingrained practice, just like brushing your teeth, getting up, making your bed, I mean, it's normal, right? I mean, and then of course, children are going to push our buttons and try to <laughs> not do it. <laughs> it's, it's I hope that answered your question. Sure. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. That's great. Um, I'm sure oh, we all I'm have. Just, thank you. I'm sorry, Betty, cutting you off. I just had two other things, two other quick thoughts is uh, also with family uh, online, no, with Common Sense Media. Um, they also have great guides on the different games. So that way you can read up on a parent's ultimate guide to such and such game. And they will also give tips on, for example, how to find that natural stopping point within a game. So let's say your child is going crazy over Fortnite. Well, if you know that Fortnite is, um, you know, a time limited game, um, um, last man standing, so to speak, and it's on a 20 minute cycle, then you know that you can say, okay, you've got one more challenge for the next 20 minutes, and then you're off. If you're, if you're going in right in the middle and, and you try to unplug it, ee, you know, you know, go for the, go for the natural breaks within the cycle. Same thing with watching Netflix, uh, watching the different movies and things like that. Um, take off the automated recommended next episode. So that way you can, you know, break the, those technology, um, break the addictive problematic use because who would who doesn't want to sit and watch all episodes of Bridgerton's and Picard and everything else and the Mandalorian I've seen it all <laughs> for sure friends on repeat yeah all exactly. right <laughs> that's great all good tips and yeah we I know my family looks at common sense media too all right so the next question we have is um related to your gaming conversation how do you do you have any tips for um, navigating 
healthy versus unhealthy online connections. So I know a lot of teenagers, especially boys who engage with friends through online gaming and girls too, um, in, in many ways that is their social interaction uh, most days, especially with the pandemic. And I know for sure, you know, this was a thing that was prevalent during the pandemic. It was a way for kids to stay connected. So um, any guidelines or recommendations on how to navigate discerning um, healthy versus unhealthy? Yeah, I, again, I think it's, we're always in that sort of space about, um, you know, being mindful as we watch our children and seeing how they are reacting. Uh, if they are, and, and of course I've seen this too, if they're taking that gaming controller and they're throwing it across the room because of something, we've got to calm down those issues, right? Um, if they are playing with this new community that they just discovered um, during the pandemic and every single time they get off the phone uh, after doing a, a gaming session, they are uplifted, they are ready to go, they have some strategic thinking, uh, they have some new ideas, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to say shut them down. Um, but if they, if you can see that when they're chatting, if they are cursing, uh, if you look and see who they're, who they are um, speaking with, if they share that with you, but you can also look to see, you know, who are the influencers, who are the gaming people that they're following. I think something that a lot of parents uh, forget is that as children are watching, um, uh, things like Minecraft on YouTube and watching somebody else play. That's another question I get all the time. Why does my child want to watch somebody else play the game instead of play the game? <laughs> but he's like, yeah, um, that's because it is just as exciting to watch, right? And yeah, see, Betty, you're like, okay, wait. So let me, let me remind you what happens if we're watching, I don't know, um, Gordon Ramsay and a cooking show, or we are watching um, the, the, I can't even think of a sporting event, the Wimbledon, you know, or we're, we're, we're watching something, right? NBA, the, the, the Super Bowl, and we're sitting there and we're totally into it and we're watching these things. It is the same sort of thing uh, for these young people, right? We're learning, we are being entertained. And so that's all it is uh, with, with why they are watching rather than playing. And I can assure you that if you ask them afterwards, they will say, oh yeah, but I learned some new tips and strategies and hacks that I'm now using in my game. through that. Okay, so uh, pivoting a little bit just to yeah. general technology question. Do you have any guidelines or recommendations in all the research you've done and the legal work that you've done and um, on when to allow a child to have a phone? Oh, <gasps> yeah, that is such a good one. Okay, because you know, there is no hard and fast rule, obviously, right? Um, I love that question. Always, I always do. It depends on your child and your situation, right? So there are families that are, um, you know, single parent households or where the child has to get to grandma's house. And so they need a phone to, to do these things, but they don't necessarily need a smartphone. They can use a text phone. They can have one of the, what they call them dummy phones, the old Nokias and things like that. So I think the question is not so much when can they have a, a phone, but when can they have a smartphone? And um, there again, if we look at um, things like uh, Digital Wellness Lab and the medical doctors and the pediatricians who are talking about neuroplasticity and our brains, right? When does a child truly become an adult and they're able to reason and think and, and um, critical thinking, et cetera? I think it's what, 23, 23 years old? So um, yeah, we're gonna have a tough time then. Um, <laughs> If that's if that's what we're gonna wait for. But I say this, um, and one of the one of my favorite um, again resources in the United States, some, something that I have looked um, at and tried to emulate in in Paris is wait until eight. Um, I really um, like their whole idea of um, having community. Do you know? Have you heard of that, Betty? Wait until eight. Okay, let me put it in the chat. Um, so wait until eight is this uh, fantastic movement um, that they say, wait until the eighth grade. Um, and um, they take a pledge that they are not going to, um, uh, you know, engage in, in technology. And I'm gonna put it to everyone uh, until eighth grade, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, if, if you take a peek at it, you'll see that it's a, it's a whole movement uh, in the United States. Um, and like I said, I, I personally like that one. And actually there was another one um, just based on the games uh, that I wanted to put in the chat too. Um, just another resource to 
um, to help you out because it's true, something that I didn't mention is um, putting parental controls on the games, right? Again, it depends on the age of the of your of your child, um, but also if you're beginning as you mean to go on, meaning you're putting parental controls on you know, pretty right away, um, then you can continue. So Ask About Games uh, also has some great um, information about uh, parental controls, how to limit um, some of these, the screenplay, how to limit some of the functions. Um, again, don't be afraid to have those conversations with your, your children. So let me give you a, another example from my own life. Uh, my son had his Nintendo Switch and he wanted to do some chatting with friends. And I was like, nope, of course not. You can pick up the home phone uh, and really the home phone. So he's sitting there like just like how we used to do with our princess telephone with the long cord, right? Um, but I had him pick up the home phone to call someone and he was like, okay. Um, and he said, but mom, you know, I really want to chat in the game. And I was like, okay, let's look at this. And so we looked at it together um, and he was able to see all the different features and he was saying, oh no, um, I don't need that. I don't need this filter. I don't need that. I don't need um, profanity. Obviously turn that off, mom. And as we went through all of the, the parental controls together, we were able to find one that allowed him to chat only with his friends and really, really friends that he knows that are accepted. So there are different ways. And part of this is also teaching your children, your young people to do it when you're not looking over their shoulder. Right, uh, because we can sit here and I can talk to you all night long about great ways to do uh, to use technology, and you can set up the best family media agreement in the world. But as soon as they go over to somebody else's house, if they are uh, out there going crazy, then that's another issue. Absolutely. Okay, so um, that's good. That's all all really <laughs> relevant, and I I'm, I know lots of. Uh, folks struggle waiting until after they're eight, much, much less eighth grade. So anyway, we, that is we do so what we can. true, Betty. That is yep. so true. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, related to when to give a child a phone, do you have any recommendations on when to give a child social media? Yes, I do. And that when I'm going to be very clear and very net as a lawyer, 13, it's 13 years old. There is a reason for this. And the reason is COPPA, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act in the United States. It is protecting your child's data. Um, they are not supposed to be, be children are not supposed to um, be advertised to. And as soon as a child sets up a fake account or an account using a fake address, they are entering into uh, another world. And then when later on, let's say they uh, enter an account and they say that they're 18, that means that the ads that they start seeing will be for 18 year olds. So, I mean, there's a whole cycle in there. And I think that something that's really fabulous that I'm seeing um, is that the United States uh, with the Kids Online Safety Act, um, the fact that California has now taken up and followed what's called the age appropriate design code, which is something that they've um, created in uh, England. The, in the Australia, there's the e-safety commissioner. Um, everyone is really trying to um, reduce online harms and trying to find ways so that way children can really have positive technical, um, um, positive experiences with technology. But again, uh, there, there is, you know, the, these underlying issues of, of age and how much can parents do. And parents, you can say no. You can get other, you can get in your community. And when, before, uh, one other thought, before you really, really um, listen to your child who says, but everybody has it, go and talk to the other parents in the, in the classroom because not everybody has it. I, yes, some kids do. In fact, I was just reading that there are TikTok users as young as three years old in the United Kingdom. Now, obviously these kids are not setting up the accounts on their own. Um, it is with parents. And I also say um, with total transparency, if you do have your child, uh, if you do give them social media under 13, be there for them. Be uh, just like uh, a stage mother if you have uh, your child, you know, doing a movie. Um, just kind of think of it as would you have them go over to, I don't know, some star's house unattended? Of course not. You're going to be there because you're the, the stage mom. It's the same thing if they have a social media account and they're online. Um, it's not, in, this is not any sort of stranger danger because it's not um, always the strangers that you need to be worried about. It's the people that that are within your child's uh, own uh, community. And I don't want to get into some of the, the dark things, but I will, I think I, Betty, I sent you, um, 
I thought I did. Did I send you um, some of the positive parenting uh, scenarios from the Council of Europe? Did I send that? I'm not sure. We, we okay. should collect uh, no, all of your resources at the end. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll make sure to just put it in the chat right now as we're waiting for the next question. Um, because I think that things like this, um, you can find different scenarios and when you and when you see what some of these um what can happen i think it's a little bit easier for parents to to respond um because you know it's not the first time that they've ever heard of it or or seen it and yes i have it there we go put it right there for everyone that's great thanks for that sure and we'll have to pull those out and put them into um Yep, it's just a free a free download. So you can just download them and and, and grab the links. I just did, yep. did this fast from the website. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Okay, we've got more questions to come. So um, the next question is: uh, Are there resources that you could recommend? And maybe you even just did. It's okay to find understandable, user friendly parental controls. So I think not exactly, but maybe you. Uh Yes. Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. So um, first, I think um, connect safely. Um, they should have a system on parental controls. So it's, it's ironic because the one that I'm thinking of uh, for sure is here in France, but that's, that's not going to help you. But I can give you a few that are in, uh, in, in, um, in English that are from England, uh, because really um, it's the same if it's an Xbox, if it's, a, if it's an Android, et cetera. So let me just put that in the chat because I think that it's true that understanding and um, I mean, I think it's great that parents are even thinking about these things um, and understanding how they work and how to install them is, is just so key. So that way you can, again, have that sort of balance. Um, and again, don't forget that you can, um, filter the content, meaning that you can just, you know, that you can, your child can sit there and watch six hours. Let's say they're homesick for, the, for you know, and they're not feeling well and you want them to watch six hours, but it's going to be six hours of positive content. You can do that. You can, um, you know, do create whitelist or create blacklist. And let me give you the website that will help you do that. And it should be, here we go. Here's some, and I'm gonna put more in there. Okay, this is really helpful. So we're gonna copy and, and paste all the items from the chat and put them in a document that we'll share along with all the other resources um, that you have shared with us tonight. So we really appreciate that. Yeah. So as you keep pasting, we'll I'm pasting copy, away, pulling yeah. them over. But awesome. I, I do think, um, uh, and I've also shared Digital Wellness Lab. I really think that um, that I mean, th they're the pediatricians. They are the the doctors. Um, that is their job, uh, looking out for our our children's digital well being. So when they come out with um, tips and strategies and different things in the newsletter, uh, we should be reading it first from them. Okay, great. We have, um, I was just going to say we have three more questions, but I, we keep having three more questions because we keep getting to it. So we still have three more questions. So one that just came in that's related to that one. And so hang in there for folks that asked other questions. I'm just trying to put them in a logical order. Um, somebody just asked, I've heard of apps that kids are able to download that circumvent some parental controls. What? Kids getting around things their parents want them to do? Do you know if there are ways to override things like that? Yeah. So again, um, this is always the fun, the fun thing. So one of my favorite um, parental control apps features is just, you know, having your, um, your, your Apple smartphone, right? And using screen time on the phone where you can just go in and click screen time and you can set limits on your child's devices. You can pair your smartphone with their iPad, with their computer, et cetera, right? Sounds great, sounds lovely. You can do the same thing on Android and with family, uh, Google's family link, sounds great, sounds lovely. And what do our teens do? What do our children do? They just reset the clock and you reset the clock and then the parental controls don't work. So, you know, there is nothing that is foolproof, which is why, um, and, and really, if your child does do something like that and they, they break it, I, I personally think that you need to say, 
bravo, you're, uh, you are a coding rock star, you are figuring things out and thinking, but now let's put that, you know, all that uh, digital uh, brain power to, to better use, um, because it is pretty, uh, they are pretty creative uh, with being sneaky, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and so this is why I do tell parents that really you are the parental control. Um, it's, it, the buck stops with you. It's, unfortunately, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Yeah, it's just yeah. reality. It's it is good. the reality, yeah. yeah. And I think there's, you know, different phones have different features, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and again, I think it's important, Betty, to also stress that even if we, even if you lock it all down, right, that that, bit, that gaming console, that phone, that tablet, that computer, what happens when they go next door? You know, um, I've, I've had all sorts of stories like this. You know, I had one where there was a, a he was a younger child and the parents um, confiscated all of the gaming consoles and tablets. Um, and uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. They confiscated, um, they didn't confiscate them. They wanted to, and they said, no, we're not going to. We're just going to cut internet. So they, they turned off the internet, you know, at certain hours. And they said, well, this is great. Our child is now outside and, you know, this is lovely. He's gardening more and more in the backyard yard turns out the child had you know gotten one of his gaming consoles and had tapped into the neighbor's wi-fi and was just out in the garden gaming so um yeah you 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 are the parental control yeah it's just the way it is yep yeah. all right um right now i've got two left i'm going to ask you a different sort of question then we're going to come back to parental stuff because we've hit that for a while so um this is a toughie do you have any recommendations have you run into um, good options for treating screen overuse. So what if you think you, your child has a problem? How hundreds of ways, you know, we can imagine why one might think a child would have a problem. Yeah. Uh, any ideas for treating screen yeah. overuse, detoxing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, and I'm sorry, just one last thing I did also put in from internet matters. And I think that's actually what you're, what they're, people are looking for it is um so it tells you you know by netflix or at disney plus parental controls for every single thing so i think that's the, probably the best one um so going back to this question about uh what was it exactly what can you do what well treatment strategies for someone who okay. is suffering yes. from screen overuse yes yeah um you, you you as a parent don't try to do it alone um you know really the these are tough issues. There are now psychologists who specialize in this. Um, there are pediatricians who specialize in this. Um, I can actually, I can put in the, the names uh, of one who has a, a website on the East Coast. Um, and they are the ones who can ad address uh, others uh, to help you. Because really, this, these are issues that I'm, I'm just going to say, it's not a matter of having a few tips and strategies. Um, this is something where you, you, you need um, help. You need help. And, um, and like I said, there's no, I haven't seen anyone create a, a sort of, um, you know, the psychologist's guide to problematic use um, because they're the ones who need to be involved in, in the treatment plan. Um, and, and detoxing um, is some, one of the lighter ways where, you know, me in the in the industry, I can say, you know, well, why not? Um, you know, just go away on vacation. They take a um, do a, a a digital log off for the week, things like that. I think that those are all th those things are all great. They give you a little break, but they don't get to the root problem, and that's what we that's what needs to be um, resolved. It's kind of like again, I keep using food examples, but it's kind of like overeating. I mean, you can sit there and 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 just make sure that your child has a salad, you know, with every meal and fruits and vegetables. But if you don't understand why they're going to go out and um, you know scarf down all that chocolate and candy when you're not around, then you're not going to get to the to the root of the problem. Betty, okay, we well, got to find something positive and fun. Oh, I know. I'm Ooh. sorry. There, they, well, we wouldn't we wouldn't ask you about the easy things, you know. Uh, I, guess, I guess so. I guess right? so. Yeah. I think we can figure those fun things out ourselves. So true. Um, Very true. I know. Okay, I know. I'll take it that I know. way. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Um, so, uh, so we celebrate our children when they keep the agreements. I'm just going to yeah. try to rephrase these into <laughs> positive. Um, so when we make parenting agreements with our children and they keep them, we're really excited. Um, however, question for you, uh, what are some or best accountable accountability strategies when the agreements that you yes. mentioned earlier yes. are broken? Again, I love this question because the answer is right in front of your face. 
ask your children. They know what they don't want to do. And if you have two kids, you ask one, you know, to say what 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 should it be for the other and and vice versa. So I know with my own boys, um, one hates to do uh, unload the dishwasher and the other one hates to walk the dog. So, you know, those are some of those consequences, right? Um, and it's it's deterrence, it's natural deterrence. Um, but I also think that the, the more that you're talking with your children and teenagers, the more you're getting involved, getting them involved with this and they have to hear it over and over again and not that sort of nagging, but just listen, you know, I understand that you enjoy technology. I understand that you want to play these video games. I get it. I just played 20 minutes with you too. It is a lot of fun, but obviously you can't do it all the time. So this is why I need you to help me set some limits and you keep having those conversations. And if you're sitting here saying, okay, that's great, but um, you know, what do I do? with an older child um, or, or, you know, I just bought them a console or I don't know, then, then pick a, a moment. So for example, it's end of the school year is coming or um, Mother's Day was just in the United States, it's in France, another couple of weeks, uh, Father's Day is coming up. Um, just whatever little holidays, um, Christmas, Hanukkah, if you're celebrating, if you're giving them some other piece of technology, then change the agreement at that time you know you know you don't need to do this um you know once a year except you can change all the time to make it more flexible to um, follow where they're at let's say they you know got some awesome grades um or they did some great volunteer work or they've just been super kind and polite and you're and you just want to revisit some of these issues uh with them the best thing that any digital parent can do today is is to keep those conversations going it is the only way that you will know what's happening um, in your child's life. I can sit here and tell you all about the latest viral challenges. I can tell you all about the latest social media uh, platforms and what is not so great, or even what's happening on some of the gaming platforms. But if you don't know if your child is at that level or going there, you're not going to be able to support them. And that's the name of the game here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that. Yes. Of course, that's uh, there's these questions aren't, you know, they're not one size fits all. I don't have any more questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add? You have a minute to to just send us any more questions. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for your time for sure. Yeah. Staying up. Yeah. way past any normal bedtime <laughs> across see, the ocean. I'm still smiling and giggling. I know, I, you're going to fall over as soon as we turn this off. I, I probably will, but you like this. No, I just, I just love this topic so much. And, and I mean, I just think this is just such a key issue. And I think Betty, that it's just really wonderful that you, that you have organized this event. And, and again, as I said, even if I'm not here, these can, these conversations need to continue. You need to have just coffee chats with them and say, you know, how are you doing with your, your technology use? You know, just ask them. It's like asking somebody, you know, how do you, how's that diet going? You know, what's your exercise plan this week? It is that simple. You have to stay informed with each other and, and, you know, use me as the catalyst to get you going. Um, but keep those conversations going. Great. And I just put your website in the chat and of course it will be in um, the resources that we post on the focus website. So ucfsd.org slash focus look for the recording of this event, the slides and all the resources there in within the next week or two. Yay. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we are all set. Thank you again, Elizabeth, for your time. Really Not appreciate a problem. it. I appreciate it. And please, the next time, Betty, if you hear any of the, the good stories, I want you to forward them to me, right? No, no more Sounds horror great. stories. I want Sounds great. positive ones. You send them so I can know that everybody's well, gonna, okay. We're going to have lots of positive ones. Thanks to your good advice. So Super. I love it. All okay. right. Thanks, folks. Have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>